part of the Earglue Media family of podcasts. You're listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. Welcome to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We're your hosts, Maggie and Nicole. So I first saw The Courier in March, and I knew instantly that I wanted to eventually do a Petticoats and Poppies episode about it, but it had a little bit of a weird release, so I wanted to wait until more people had seen it. But I think it's a really fascinating story and one that I certainly had no idea about, and it's a bit of a twist on this kind of Cold War spy film. And now that it's on Amazon Prime and people can easily watch it, I thought that we should cover it. So it was originally titled Iron Bark, and it premiered at Sundance in January 2020. It is directed by Dominic Cook and written by Tom O'Connor. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch stars as Mr. Wynn, uh, with Murab Nendez as Oleg Pinkowski. Uh, it also stars Rachel Brosnahan, Jesse Buckley, and Angus Wright. Uh, it is about a British businessman and a Soviet source who traded information that essentially ended the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I'm not a huge Benedict Cumberbatch fan, but <laughs> this actually kind of changed my mind. I think that he typically plays sort of the same character in a lot of movies, and this character is quite mm-hmm. different from that. I think this is one of the more likable characters he's ever played. This guy is not the typical, like, let's be honest, he typically plays, like, intellectual asshole characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, 100%. And this is a bit different than that. He gets a little bit of a chance to be a bit more charming. Um, There's that scene where they're, like, in the club dancing and he's doing his little, like, twist dance. And I was like, this is so fun. Like, uh, it was the first time that I really understood the appeal of of good old old Benadryl Cucumber. (laughs) Um, so that was. You said you weren't going to say that in the episode. And then I said I wasn't, but I can't help myself. That's all that my sister and I call him. Um, I said it once. Now I'll call him by his real name. Hopefully, we'll see. Um, but so I was call like really me by your name. Sorry. <laughs> I was really impressed by this, and also like he gives a genuinely very good performance in it, and um, a very transformative performance as well physically. Uh, but I, I really wasn't sure how I was going to feel about this going in because Dominic Cook is a really well-respected English director. He has done two shows at the John Bar Warehouse. He's, you know, sort of made his name in theater, but I very much did not like the film on Chesil Beach. So Mm -hmm. I was like, oh God, who knows what this will be? And I think that for me, why this movie is so effective is because it's about a very normal guy who gets wrapped up in all of this like espionage stuff. Uh, And I find that a lot more compelling than your typical spy story, which is about, you know, a spy doing their spy thing, which has never really appealed to me. But this story, I think, is a little bit of a twist on that. And it's much more focused on the friendship between, uh, I think it's Greville Wynn and his source, um, Oleg Pinkowski. Um, And the friendship aspect of it and the way that Greville comes to, like, legitimately care for him I think is what made me like it so much. Uh, and there's there's also there's stuff, like fun moments in it. Like they're at the club and they're dancing. Or like when uh, his young son asks, do the Russians really hate us that much? <laughs> um, I was delighted. I was absolutely delighted. And I think it also does a pretty good job of like exploring his moral quandary of like whether or not spying is worth this personal risk to him and his family. Um, and the way that it sort of starts to tear apart his relationship with his wife because he can't tell her what he's doing. So she thinks she's he's having an affair, which is something I'd never thought about. I think partially because a lot of spy films are focused on people who like are a spy for their career. So they either aren't in a relationship or they're in a relationship with someone else who's involved in the in that world. Um or they've sort of already made their their peace with the ways in which this is going to affect their personal life whereas we get to see him go through that sort of real time um but it's also like for the most part much less gritty than i think a lot of spy dramas like the first like hour of it um is pretty like it's almost what i would call like a dinner table movie um 
there's not really any action in the whole thing. And it's only the last like half hour that gets intense at all, really. Um, but I think it does a good job of making you care about all the characters, particularly both uh, Greville and Oleg. Uh, it builds suspense well without like, I think it does the thing where the whole way through it, you kind of have an idea of where it's heading. Like, you kind of have to know. And yet still, it's hard not to hope it's not going to go there. Uh, and I think the last half hour of this is a very different film than the rest of it is. Um, and it's genuinely like pretty harrowing. And Benedict's physical transformation is kind of insane. And I did hear from someone that like that was actually all real like like he legitimately lost that much weight and it's none of it's you know they didn't cgi him at all there's some makeup work but it's it's not significant makeup work it's it's that he actually lost the weight um but i think like the scene where they're at the ballet is stunning the scene between the two of them in the prison is stunning um the score is really lovely um and in researching this and i'm obviously going to get into this later but there are still so many questions about the truth behind Wynn's story because uh, later in life, he told a lot of falsehoods about things and a lot of things that don't line up and a lot of things that we know can't have been true. And so it's very hard to piece together what the truth actually might be behind all of this. But I actually think considering the material that we have about these men and about the situation, that this is actually a remarkably accurate film there's some like liberties taken in terms of like these you know Rachel Brosnahan's character is a composite character of a few different people um and I'll get into this later but obviously like the two men never talked while they were in prison um but otherwise I actually think like for the most part it really does capture the heart of what we think what historians think is true about these two men and I think it's it's really cool to have a story about them considering the fact that Greville Wynn never really got his due when he was alive because he was never recognized by the British government. Mm -hmm. So in a miraculous, this is, I'm going to like just make a big deal out of this real fast, real quickly. Um, I don't think we've had an episode before where I liked to film more than Maggie did. Um, I am notoriously the bad cop of this podcast and I'd like to say that for today, I'm hanging up that hat and giving it to Maggie. Um, I just have to make a big deal out of it. I'm sorry. I can't help myself. I feel like post uh, Toronto International Film Festival, I am now much more like, eh, this actually didn't work for me. Um, so kudos to me. <laughs> You've come to the dark uh, side. Love to see growth. Love to see yep. growth. Um, so I don't know if it was because I was packing while I was watching this, but I ended up just like, not enjoying this at all maybe it's because like i do like a slightly grittier spy drama like i love spies i love this genre this was just unremarkable <laughs> um and like i'd heard so many good things about this movie from you from other people who had seen it and so i had like really high expectations i also me. think you watched it in october and i watched it in march which was a freaking freaking wasteland for movies like yeah true because i watched like, i've it, seen yeah 26 movies at this point so like maybe that's why but i i just i thought it was really slow and i found it to be incredibly boring like on okay this is gonna sound really bad and i'm so sorry but like at a certain point it was like it would actually be interesting if he was having an affair because oh like at God. this point because it just felt like there was nothing like i personally did not see much of a chemistry between him and his wife which like made their like very long scenes kind of like very boring to me i do think like i don't love jesse buckley in this role and i like jesse buckley it's otherwise. a bad role for her like, like and i think someone else maybe could have like benedict cumberbatch is actually someone who typically seems to have pretty good chemistry with people I chemistry like. with everybody like like there was a point where i was like you have better chemistry with oleg than you i was do oh i was wife. like all right um but I think which confused me because like he's very good at working and I like I felt like that was just because the wife's character was not really well written and like she is required to have like a lot of emotional weight that's then applied on to the second half. I think about something like The Imitation Game, uh, mm -hmm. another Benedict Cumberbatch movie with a not very well written female character, but mm -hmm. Kira Knightley carries that off and they have great chemistry. Uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of ironic considering the story. But like, yeah. I think if if someone who had chemistry with him, like Kira Knightley or someone like that, had been in this role, that all would have come off better. 
yeah. I, I my whole thought, and maybe it's because like I have just seen the Electrical Life of Louis Wayne, which is like my favorite role that Benedict Cumberbatch has ever been in, and he had such marvelous chemistry with Claire Foy, mm-hmm. which like made me like giggle, which made me cry, which made me feel so many emotions. And then with this, I was like, I am feeling nothing with this connection. Like, and there wasn't even any like interaction with like Rachel Brosnahan, who she has chemistry with everybody. Even their scenes, like just talking, there was no real good chemistry, like just like communication chemistry, which I think is. Is partially be- because I do think they were trying to make it clear that, like, there isn't anything going on between the two of them. Yeah. I'm d- I just mean, like, with – it didn't feel like there was, like, heart and a lot of, like, the dialogue and stuff. And I think that it was because they were emphasizing how, like, very plain and simple this whole situation was. Like, this is, like, a very common person. And there's a reason why, like, common people aren't the the big main focus of movies because, like, they don't have that, like, and I'm just saying, like, the intriguing thing. Like, it wasn't, it was boring. I found it very boring and I wanted to like so it. Which is so funny because like, I've watched it twice now and I found it, like, pretty it's... riveting both times. Um, I just was like, is this over yet? I was like, is it? What? This movie is, like, it's not that long. Now I really am thinking, though, I wish Claire Foy had played the wife character in this. Jeez, oh, my God. Um, I cannot wait for you to see that movie because their chemistry is I'm seeing is it soon. S- yeah, I'm seeing it so soon, thank good. God. But I will say I love the ballet scene and I did like the club scene. Like, those were two good mo- – and that was, like, the moments where I was like, you were seeing something. Like, you're getting an emotional response. And I think it might be down to the script not allowing room for a lot of – um character interaction it was more like point a to point b to point c and i think they're very focused on like the main relationship of this film is between mm-hmm. greville and oleg greville and like, oleg yeah that and is that, the focus that and i do think that's because like that is a somewhat unique relationship um mm-hmm. in that they work together for a long time and oleg is like considered to be like one of the most important assets to the intelligence community in britain that like ever existed but also, like, he and Greville seemed to, like, form a legitimate friendship. Yeah. Yeah. That was a highlight. Like, their scenes were very good. I also, I understand why this film doesn't go into it, because I get what its focus is. But, man, I'm going to get into this, but I started reading about Greville Wynn after he got out of prison. hmm Fascinating. Like, maybe more interesting than the actual spying. A wild, wildlife. A wildlife. We'll we'll get I into it. I cannot wait to hear about it. Yeah. I think it's time to get into it now. Isn't Are it? you ready? I was gonna say I don't wanna like overstep you if you still I have think, things to yeah. say. Yeah. I don't okay. I don't wanna keep like bashing the film because I do feel bad. It's not bashing the film, it just didn't work for me. Like I'm happy yeah. it works for other people. There were parts that was like, this kind of feels like it could have been tighter. I do think it is in many ways like a spy movie for people who don't like spy movies. If you're someone who prefers like dramas, like relationship dramas and that sort of thing. If you're someone who, like, I know this is a weird thing about me. I'm very drawn to films that are about male friendship. This is, like, a really good example of that in a yeah. historical period. And that's done very well. I have no qualms with that. So the screenwriter, Tom O'Connor, uh, I, I read an interview with him and he said that about Greville Wynn. He was just an ordinary man who got thrust into this just extraordinary life-altering situation that was going to define his existence forever. And everything about Wynn up until this point is very pedestrian. He's born in 1919 in Wales. He goes to Nottingham University to study engineering. And he's a businessman selling electrical equipment after the war. And he often travels to Eastern Europe for business. Um, And so because of that, he is approached and asked to join the MI6. And Benedict Cumberbatch in an interview said, He came from a very humble background, but was always trying to better himself. He started as a naive amateur, and Greville Wynn fit the bill simply as somebody who was taking business into Eastern Europe. They were looking for someone who could fly under the radar because he was already going there and could help them, you know, smuggle out things from Oleg Pinkowski. And so in 1960, he is chosen to be Oleg Pinkowski's contact to pass information to. And they worked together for 14 months, and Pinkowski passed him photos of 5,000 secret papers. Um, And so these were incredibly important things that were being passed. Uh, And they also would go back and forth visiting each other. You know, Oleg also came to the UK. Like, I don't think that you can overstate how important the information that was passed along through these two men was to like the state of affairs and to the cold war 
uh, at the time. But eventually, you know, you do this sort of thing for 14 months straight and people start to pick up on things and people started to notice their friendship and the fact that they were seen about town together a lot. And when was arrested by the KGB, he was actually at a trade fair in Budapest and he was flown back to the Soviet Union in October of 1962. Both men were given what was essentially a show trial, and uh, they both pled guilty in May of 1963. But my understanding is that Wynn sort of did try to plead that he didn't really understand what was in the, in what he was passing along in hopes that that would help him. And the British continued to deny any affiliation with him. Um, and to my understanding, they actually have never formally acknowledged that he was working for him, them, although like he obviously was. He was convicted and he was sentenced to serve eight years of imprisonment, uh, three in prison, five in a labor camp. An interesting thing, which I know you'll probably touch on this later, but when like firmly believed that Pimkovsky committed suicide in prison, uh, but he was held at Lub Lubyanka. I'm not good at Russian. I'm probably butchering every Russian name that I say. I'm so sorry. Uh, for 18 months. And he was beaten and tortured. And eventually his health got so bad that they were concerned. And so the exchange that we see between the two men in, in the prison definitely was uh, imagined. But Benedict Cumberbatch actually said that that scene, in a way, it's a love letter to Pinkowski. It's a thank you from the West for what he sacrificed. So they sort of put that scene in there where when really lays out what his contribution was as a way of recognizing him. But when is eventually released in exchange for Soviet spy Conan Molody, who is also known as uh, Gordon Lonsdale in 1964, after I think only about 18 months in prison. And he goes back home and he's never formally acknowledged. He kind of tries to return to his business career, but a lot of his contacts have sort of uh, dried up while he's been, you know, in prison. Um, and he ends up actually doing these like talks about like spycraft, but he doesn't actually know anything about any of this because he wasn't, you know, involved in the MI6 in, in the way that most people were. So it's a lot of just like lying about things. And he publishes two books. There's The Man from Moscow in 1967, not long after he gets back. And then The Man from Odessa in 1981. And most historians have looked at them and been like, well, that's not true, Ellen. Um, because they're just full of things that like cannot possibly have happened. Like he talks about, I think he talks about like meeting the president of the United States, which definitely did not occur. But he also struggled with depression and alcoholism. And he divorced his, his first wife and then also had like an unsuccessful second marriage. And he eventually died of throat cancer at the age of 70. Um, in London in 1990. Uh, so yeah, I think as someone who started out life very unremarkable, that sounds mean, I don't mean it in a mean way, but like very unremarkable, got involved because he was recruited for the fact that he was unremarkable in this kind of extraordinary thing, and then has a very strange rest of his life. And, and definitely most historians agree that like, those 18 months that he did spend in prison and probably also like not to like psychoanalyze him, but the fact that he did become close supposedly to Oleg and then Oleg was either executed or committed suicide, whichever one you want to believe, um, definitely gave him lasting psychological issues, which like, uh, <laughs> can I say this? No shit, Sherlock, like being tortured in a prison <laughs> will Sherlock. give you psychological issues. Funny because you played Sherlock. <laughs> I had to make the joke. Um, I was like, sh can I say, can I say that word? And then I was like, I have to for the sake of saying Sherlock. Um, like, obviously that's going to give you psychological issues. Just a little. Right. But so I think like. Just casual. He ends up being a very interesting man. And it's honestly a little bit surprising to me that we haven't had like more of a, there, there've been like some, some different projects made about him in the past. Like there's a, a documentary, um, but I'm surprised that there's not been more made about him before now. Very interesting. Um. So, as I said at the beginning of the episode, the career was originally entitled Iron Bark, which was Oleg's codename. Uh, so, I felt like it was only right that we should also talk about Oleg. 
Uh, he was born in the Soviet Union on April 23rd, 1919. Uh, he graduated from the Kiev Artillery Academy with the rank of lieutenant in 1939. After taking part in the Winter War against Finland and in World War II, he reached the rank of lieutenant colonel. Uh, by 1960, he had become colonel in the GRU and deputy chief of foreign section of the State Committee for the Coordination of Scientific Research, uh, which is a position he held until 1962. Uh, in this post, his task was essentially to collect scientific and technical intelligence on the United States and Britain uh, and the Western countries and it was during this period of time that he began to become more disillusioned by the Soviet Union. Uh, so in July of 1960 he approached uh, American students who were at the um, Balashev Moskovetsky Bridge in Moscow. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of um, consonants. It was a little too much for me there. Um but he, he approached this group of American students who were on this bridge in Moscow, and he gave them a package, which they then delivered to the CIA. Uh, by April 1961, he offered his services to British intelligence through um, Greville Wynn, uh, who, of course, was a British businessman. Now, there's a lot of speculation about why he chose to give his information, um, with the leading belief being that he felt uh, stunted in his career with the GRU and expected that by helping the West for a year or two that he and his family would be able to relocate and build a better life and that he would personally be showered with recognition and honor. And I think that the film touched on this a little bit with like his determination to make sure that his family was okay and that it was like a better life for family um so i think they like kind of touched on that um at least one former mi5 officer believed that oleg was a fake defector which i think is fascinating um yes it is a whole thing um okay. which is is then loosely backed up by a KGB major general who failed to mention him in his comprehensive memoir of everything that happened with intelligence during this period of time. He is not mentioned at all. Huh. Which is is wild. Like on one yeah. hand, this is some this is somebody who also like defected, who does not mention him. Which I think is fascinating. It would make more sense if it was just like purely the KGB being like, no, this did not happen. We yeah. did not have this defector. <laughs> yeah. Like that that would make sense to me. But the fact that it's like another defector that's like mm, I'm not even going to mention this dude because I don't know. It's weird. It's whole, the whole situation is very strange to me. And then there's like other KGB defectors who are like, yeah, he was real. I knew him. But like this, like my brain just doesn't comprehend like this massive discrepancy between these two sources. Uh, and this is why you should always have multiple sources and not just one primary source. There also seems to be a lot of uncertainty about like his role in general. And then, of course, like, there's the whole thing that you you briefly touched on, like, Wynn has been called a liar. <laughs> Most notably, um, an intelligence researcher and author, very well respected in the community, uh, Nigel West, does not seem to have a high favorable opinion of Wynn um, and has poked holes, like you said, in a lot of these fabrications and lies and tall tales, which has then kind of drawn into suspicion like how much of what actually happened in russia actually happened like what where's the truth and that is a whole angle that i think is fascinating and like as you said like um oleg was arrested in october of 1962 uh he was put on trial this kind of sham show trial uh, for treason um and he was found guilty and sentenced to death um there are also unsurprisingly um, major conflicting opinions and reports on what happened to him when he died. Um, some suggest that he was executed, while others suggest that he committed suicide to avoid execution. Um, there are also some reports that he was executed by cremation, oh, which shit. is horrifying. Like, there is, Jesus. I found this, this, like, random, and, like, obviously there's so much speculation about this, like, this could not be true. Like, who knows what the validity is of any of these claims. But there was a crematorium in the town where he was being held that claimed that he was brought there alive. 
But then there was other people that said that that was not true. So, like, I don't understand why there's so much speculation about these two men who, like, very clearly did something. But, like, the the historian doubter side of me is, like, there's a part, like, is there a reason why, like, both of these parties, like, the British and the KGB have both been like, we don't know who these men are. Like, what happened? Right. What information was passed? Like, there has to be some reason that there is this major discrepancy in what these men did. Which I guess it could be partially, like, this might sound funny, but, like, a little bit on the KGB side, or, on, on, you know, on the Russian side, a little bit of embarrassment that he was able to pass that much before they caught him. But it's weird that there's other defectors. It's, like, the whole thing is just, it, it's weird. I also, I, I do know, though, that, like, he had a wife and child. Yes. Who lived out the rest of their lives in In Moscow. Russia. Right. So maybe there's also an element of, like, other defectors not wanting to, like risk their family right like say too much and his family get some sort of retribution because it becomes yeah. too public i don't know it's weird and and like with so the british also with the british also not acknowledging when like those two things in concert with each other make for me going like okay what was actually going on and now, i why think are part both... of the thing with win is the fact that he gets back and he like three years later publishes a book and it's like yeah. this is what happened um and so and then like, everyone's so, like that's not what happened <laughs> right well and he also like he gives some like outlandish claims in it um but even beyond that they're like you're not supposed as a spy you're not supposed to get out of prison and immediately publish a memoir like while we're like it comes out in 67 like this is not all resolved by 67. No. You know what I mean? Like, I think that that sort of we plays into We still have it. these issues. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that sort of plays into the fact that, like, if he had not done that, maybe they would have recognized him at some point. Maybe. The whole thing is just weird. And I kind of love that. I love history mysteries. And this feels like one of those history mysteries. And I think that it being so weird and there being so many questions actually lends itself very well to being made into a film in that. 100%. There's can, room for. There's room for interpretation. Yeah. Like, they can sort of decide what they want to do with it. And nobody can tell them that they're wrong per se. Because we don't know. Like, exactly. <laughs> which is. It's, I think that's like. If I were writing. A movie. I would think that it would be easier in some ways to write about a historical subject in which there isn't all that information or the sources are so conflicting that you do have a real liberty that you can take and people not be able to accuse you of like blatantly ignoring history because you're like, well, nobody knows. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's fascinating. But, you know, the movie, for all of my issues with it, was very beautiful in the costumes department. Uh, the costumes were designed by Keith Madden, who is perhaps best known for his work on The Woman in Black and the newly released film The Forgiven, uh, and his decades-long work on the British TV series Doctors. Um, in a film like this, you can't really make many mistakes. Uh, this is a very well-documented time period. Uh, and when you're working with real people, you can consult pictures, televised interviews, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the costumes really help to build the aesthetics uh, for a film like this, especially when you have larger crowd scenes, when you're you know, at the club or at the ball or at the the ballet like there's those things like that that like you really have to get even the deepest background person right and i think they really did this i think the aesthetics really worked um there isn't really a lot to talk about because the men's costumes are you know what is to be expected of 1960s <laughs> um nothing too like shocking i really like the dresses they put rachel brosnahan in um i liked the scene when she goes back to the embassy and they're like watching the tv um i like some of the dresses that the um some of the background performers were wearing mm -hmm. um it was after their taste she's taken into custody when she gets back to the the embassy um that scene i like some of those costumes um but yeah i mean it was a very it was a very straightforward very simple film um mr madden seemed very excited about it i found that he has a website where he like posts about um his films and stuff which is quite fun uh and he had a it's finally here. Very excited post. Um, so he was very clearly proud of his work and he should be. It was a very good work. But yeah, I mean, I, it's so funny with 
movies like this, it's like there's really not a lot to say. Like, there's no real, like, fantasy. There's no big, like, showstopper. There's no, you know, spooky costumes for Halloween or anything like that. <laughs> it's very straightforward, um, which I do like. This is, like, the easiest style of film to costume. I don't mean that by, like, it, it's easy because it's not. But, like, you don't have a lot of, like, having to come up with things from scratch. You just have to make sure that they match what the performer is doing and the time period that you are trying to represent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, do you have any closing thoughts on this film? Which used to be called Iron Bark. It is now called The, the Courier. The Courier? The, the cur- Courier? The Courier. I feel, courier. Like I, I feel like I don't say it right. And I think it's the just courier. my accent. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, I I think it's interesting that Benedict has finally started to kind of step out of the same the role <laughs> role that he's been pigeonholed into and he really fits historical roles i was trying to figure out how to say it. like he has a face for historical films he has a face that i can believe has never seen a microwave exactly um like i like the first season of sherlock i'm so sorry to people who watch sherlock and listen to this i like the first season of sherlock and then i like kind of lost interest in it uh, and I think it was because, like you said, he plays, like, very unlikable characters for that period of time. But this one, like, he was fine. Like, not my favorite role. Coming off of The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne, which is, like, seriously, probably my, like, second favorite movie this entire year. Oh, God. Um, I literally cannot wait for you to see it. It made me feel so many emotions. Like, oh, I'm I so cried. excited. I cried. I, like, was under my covers. Like, oh, my God. I'm like, I felt – so much. I'm reviewing it for Next Best Picture later this month, but I also think it's actually, uh, I believe it's coming to our film festival here in North Carolina, Film Fest 911, which I will be covering as press. Um, So I think I'm going to get to see it in a theater, which is pretty exciting. Excellent. Um, It is the year of Benedict Cumberbatch, though. Like, I know it's it's also the year of Adam Driver. It's also the year of Oscar Isaac. Like, they've both got a ton of projects, too. But I realized Benedict Cumberbatch in this, like, Oscar season – has uh this movie he has the power, power of, the of the dog. dog he has electrical life of louis wayne and he has spider-man what is it spider-man no way home yes. um which Man's i have been busy i will say like god i can't believe i'm putting this on a podcast um watching that spider-man trailer i was like i've never understood the appeal of dr strange and then i was like oh huh he just needed okay. to wear a parka. He just needed to wear a parka and give like a cheeky wink at the camera. And suddenly I'm like, oh, like. Yeah, I will say like the electrical life of Louis Wayne was the first time I looked at Benedict Cumberbatch and I was like, I, I can make it work. <laughs> I love this for us. Both of us this year found movies where we're like, oh, I think it's there was a thing where like if you were on the internet in a certain time period. You saw so much of like, his face. Well, also I feel like girls who had our interests either became benedict cumberbatch girls or tom hiddleston girls we became tom and we became tom hiddleston girls you know this is very true that is the exact subset of the internet exactly like there's a subset of the internet that like if you were this if you were the type of girl who was like i like period dramas and tea and you know and reading books reading books and jane austen and like clothes that look vintage but aren't actually um then you had to pick a man and those were your choices and we both picked tom were you a mustache girl too i was like, not okay but i i, I was i was i should have been if that makes sense okay okay you know because like i was a i was a mustache i must ask you a question like i yeah. had a necklace that you could flip up and hold as a mustache like i was a mustache and i i always wonder what that subset of the internet would like which way they would go would they go benedict or or tom and i felt like it was a tom thing because it was more of that like vintage clothes that weren't actually vintage when you said that i was like okay same subset of the internet it's like Um, vintage clothes that like you're trying to go for a vintage aesthetic but you're actually shopping at delia's like yeah (laughs) wow called out um but, you know, I'm just – I love that Benedict's finally exploring these different roles. Mm-hmm. Um, I Like, I will say, like, Electrical Life of Louis Wayne, he is yet again another, like, um, you know, same specific type of character, but he's not mean. 
<laughs> and that's very <laughs> likable. He's very likable because he's playing a character who had schizophrenia. Um, mm. um, so yeah. like, there's elements of of mental health, which I think he right. in past has a, embodied characters that portrayed those aspects in a more negative fashion, um, like as an excuse for being a jerk. Um, whereas I think like in that film, it was explored much more delicately. Um, which I really appreciate it and it made me cry. And I was like, I cannot believe I'm crying for a Benedict Cumberbatch movie. <laughs> um, but I am really excited to see more people see that. Um, I'm also really excited to see The Power of Dog at some point because so many people are yeah. saying it's like the best role he's ever done. And I was like, you just haven't seen The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne, clearly. I also do think he is going to get nominated for the Oscar for The Power of the Dog. I hope he does. pretty exciting. Um, I hope he does. I'm like excited for that to happen for him um, because I do feel like he's one of those actors who's like, been putting in his his work in the industry for years he's done the Mm -hmm. theater he's done the tv he's done the film and it's nice to see him get recognition for that even like even though i'm not a big fan of his it's still nice to see him get recognized for it and i'm also just excited for like him to have his first big serious oscar project i think i mean other other than obviously the imitation game but like it's been a while since the imitation game um that he's not really had like a project that was like big Oscar consideration. And I think he is someone that even when I don't like love what he's doing, he's always doing good work. Um, also I said good work and all I could think was good soup. So uh, <laughs> I think that's, I think that's the key to the episode. It is true. Over. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us in our 33rd episode about The Courier, which you can watch on Amazon Prime for free if you have an account there, or you can, you know, rent it wherever you watch movies. Yes. And we'd love to hear from you on social media and to hear what you think of The Courier, if you've seen it or if you're going to watch it before listening to this episode. Um, if not, be sure to check it out at some point. Um you know, these are historical figures, so I feel like we don't spoil much. <laughs> exactly. You could have found all this out, you know, with some internet searching. Um, you can find us on social media at HGATM Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find Maggie over at Maggie of the Town. And you can find me at Nicole Ackman16. Be sure to, you know, check us out on social media because both of us have some really exciting stuff going on right now. By the time this goes up, Maggie... Will, will you still be in New York then or will you be back from New York by the time this goes? Um, it'll be like my last day. Yeah. So Maggie will have been in New York covering. Do you want to, I mean, do you want to say I don't want to like jump Yeah. I'll be covering New York Comic Con. Very excited about that. I'm also like, cannot wait to leave my state. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie's very excited to travel. Um, and then later this month, I'm going to be covering Film Fest 919, which is our film festival here in Yay. North Carolina. I'm very excited. It's going to be my third year I want to say going to the film festival I didn't go last year because of COVID but I'm very excited to be going back this year so make sure to follow us so that you can see all the cool fun things that we are doing in the month of October yes Uh, you can listen to our podcast on Spotify Apple podcast and the Airglue Media website and of course over on Audible if you like what you hear don't forget to leave us a rating over on Apple podcast and on Podchaser every few episodes we'll be reading our reviews so be sure to leave us one if you would like to be featured we'll be back soon with another episode as we continue to look at period films from a history and film perspective until then stay safe and healthy and happy October You've been listening to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We'll be back soon with another episode as we continue to look at period films from a history and film perspective. Until then, stay safe and healthy and happy October. Have some good soup. <laughs> Have some good soup. Good soup. I got to do good the hand soup. motion too. Like, good soup. <laughs> good soup. Uh.